Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Christelle Kachiko, and I'll be your webinar facilitator. Here are some housekeeping rules before I introduce you to our guest speakers today and get started on our BMSV session. Firstly, please input all your questions on the chat box below and we will go through them during the Q&A session later on. Secondly, please take a few moments to complete the feedback survey after the webinar. We value your feedback and we use it to improve our future webinars. In response to the feedback received from our last webinar, we have extended this session to 45 minutes instead of 30 minutes just to ensure that we get through all the questions during the Q&A session. So, I just wanted to say thank you once again for providing your feedback. We are taking them on board. Thirdly, a recording of this webinar will be distributed via email to you by the end of this week. Um, please reach out if you don't receive it. Otherwise, this will also be available on our social media company pages. And lastly, if you have any questions at all after this webinar, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speakers today. First up, we have Sal Malici. Head of Border and Biosecurity at the Freight and Trade Alliance. Sal is an established and licensed customs broker who has over 20 years experience in the field with a focus on trade compliance. Sal will be providing compliance from a national industry perspective. Up next is Ross Shepard, National Customs Manager here at Mondial VGL Australia. Ross is an established and licensed customs broker with over 10 years experience in the freight forwarding and logistics industry. Ross will be covering compliance from a freight forwarder's perspective. Lastly, we welcome Sam Galloway, New South Wales Warehouse Manager at Mondial VGL Australia. Sam leads and manages both the commercial and operational aspects of Mondial VGL's New South Wales Warehousing Container Treatment Services. So Sam will be providing a bit more information and insight on our onshore treatment services. Again, big welcome to Sal, Ross and Sam. So let's begin. Over to you, Sal, to start us off. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you, Christelle, for organising today. The brown marmorated stink bug, or BMSB, is a shield-shaped, brown-coloured and outwardly typical stink bug. In fact, they do look a lot like one you might find in your backyard, except for those distinct white bands you can see there on the screen. They're originally from Eastern Asia, where natural predators kept its numbers in check. However, it was recently introduced to North America and then onto Europe, where it is having a significant impact on agriculture as a nuisance pest. So why are we all here? Why do we want to keep them out? This species has a very large host range and it affects many plants. The way it does this is it causes harm while feeding and the bug saliva causes significant damage to plant tissue, essentially destroying the plant. Some of the BMSB's preferred, preferred meals include apples, beans, citrus, corn, figs, grapes, peaches, pears, raspberries, soybeans, ornamental plants and tomatoes. So the potential damage to Australia's agriculture industries and farming communities would be immense. The BMSB seasonal measures will be applied to relevant goods shipped between 1 September 2021 and 30 April 2022. Did the calculation 1 September is only 22 days away. It's just worth noting that as the end of the season is based on ship dates, it means that shipments arriving into Australia may still be subject to BMSB measures months after the season proper has ended. In previous seasons, it, it ended based on arrival date into Australia. The department has advised that they intend to run a limited BMSB verification regime across air cargo from September 1 to November 30. It'll be inclusive of chapters 84 to 87 exported from Italy and USA. These have been identified as the highest risk goods from the highest risk countries. The department is still working out how best to implement the verification regime However, they do intend to shift the verification regimes around so they do not double up on utilisation of inspectors and they're really trying to not create unnecessary additional burden on them and industry as a whole. Target risk countries. These are the countries that are subject to the mandatory measures. They're essentially the same as 2020, just with the addition of Poland. It pretty much only leaves Belarus and Lithuania in that region, not part of the list. Now, they're not huge trading partners with Australia, but I'd suspect they might be added in come upcoming years. Also of note is that, again, Japan is on the list, but it's only as a heightened vessel surveillance. So therefore, goods from Japan won't be subject to BMSB measures. In, a in addition, the department continues to review the changing risk status of BMSB and will also be undertaking random onshore inspections on goods from emerging risk countries to verify pest absence. Those countries for this season are Belarus, Malta, Sweden, United Kingdom and Chile. Just briefly, staying with the UK and Chile, there's, there's often conjecture around the status of UK before each season. 
Will it or won't it become a target risk country? Some BMSB was found in the UK last year, but not enough, it seems, to deem UK being elevated to a target risk country. I would suggest, however, that it's a logical assumption that is only a matter of time before the UK is elevated. And regarding Chile, it's just noteworthy that that's the first Southern Hemisphere country to be added as an emerging risk. Target high risk goods. There's no change here to the goods deemed target high risk, them being the goods subject to mandatory measures. As you can see, it covers many headings that are commonly imported into Australia. On this slide, that includes explosives, articles of wood, carpet, ceramic, glass and metals. The extensive list also includes tools, anything mechanical, electric or electronic, as well as vehicles and the like. There has been some talk from the department on some refinement in this area that being a, a, the potential reduction in tariff headings subject to mandatory measures. Chapter 36, which was explosive, is I believe the first one of those up for review. Unfortunately, no such refinement has been made for this season, but it is something that we are regularly advocating for whenever we meet with the department. There's also a category called target risk goods. Again, quite a few commonly imported headings here, such as anything of chemicals, plastics, rubber, paper, printed books and the like. Now, these are not subject to mandatory measures, but they may be subject to increased, or they will be subject to increased onshore intervention by way of random inspection. So it's something to be mindful of that shipments containing only risk goods, for example, may be subject to delays after arrival if they're selected for inspection. Exempt goods, which I think is everyone's favourite category, is anything where there's an exemption. There are some type of shipments that are exempt from BMSB measures. The first ones are anything that's shipped before September 1 when the season starts. Also goods that have been stored or transported to a non-target risk country prior to the start of the season. A really important one, and I think potentially underutilised, is NUFT or new, unused and not field tested. That's where goods fitting into those ch tariff chapters listed there that are manufactured on or after December 1, 2021. And there's also an exemption for unaccompanied personal effects. Compliance and verification. The department conducts random verifica verification inspections of all target high risk and target risk goods. If BMSB is detected, goods will be directed for onshore treatment. It is important to note that treatments can only be completed in a metropolitan location. The department will be undertaking compliance activities to monitor and detect the use of fraudulent treatment certificates. It is important for treatments conducted offshore that the BMSB certificate is from an approved treatment provider. Any shipment identified with a fraudulent certificate will be directed for onshore treatment if permitted or re-export, which is an extremely costly exercise. In addition, goods from known risk pathways or supply chains that have had a previous BMSB detection may also be subject to inspections or potentially other interventions, which may include retreatment. Known risk pathways are subject to review throughout the season. There's three types of treatment that are approved as a BMSB measure. I'm not going to go through all the technical details and the around the dosage rates and so on, but just briefly, um, heat is the top one there. And as you can see, the temperature required is a fairly high 56 degrees. Just worth noting that in certain parts of Europe and the USA, in the depths of winter, it can be challenging to perform such a treatment due to the cold ambient temperature. But as shown, it's handy if you're not wanting your goods treated by a fumigant. Quickly sk skip down to sulfur sulfur fluoride to again point out it can be a challenge in winter. Whilst the temperature required is only 10 degrees for this one, it needs to be maintained at that temperature for at least 12 to 24 hours, depending on the dosage. And again, that can be quite a challenge in winter. Methyl bromide is a bit of a controversial one in that it is a ozone depleting substance and banned in the European Union. However, it is available in USA and Australia as there is currently an exemption for quarantine purposes. The offshore treatment providers are required to apply each year. And so each year a completely new list is created. That means if your suppliers had a relationship with a particular treatment provider last year, it's important to check if they have reapplied and are now on, uh, on the approved treatment providers list for this season. I've talked a bit about treatment offshore, and it would be remiss if I didn't highlight that this is essentially only an option for six-sided hard containers. The department's been very clear that they won't entertain exemptions for break bulk, roll-on, roll-off, flat rack, open top, and the like. Those kind of shipments must be treated offshore, and furthermore, from September to December, they must be treated within 120 hours of being loaded onto the vessel. Now to talk about onshore treatment, I'll hand over to Ross. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Sal. Much appreciated. If your goods do fit into the, the six hard-sided container 
freight option as discussed by Sal already. Uh, the, the option is there to have your goods treated in Australia. Now, the three treatment options uh, for offshore are exactly the same as the three treatment options onshore, that being heat, methyl bromide and sulfuryl fluoride. Mondial VGL is well placed in the industry to provide services of all three uh, of these fumigation types in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth or Fremantle uh, and in Adelaide we can service you with methyl bromide or sulfuryl fluoride. We also work with many other industry partners. Uh, if we need a treatment outside of our available capacity or in Adelaide outside of the, the treatment options we provide. It's important to remember that prior to 1 December, all freight that fits into the high risk category goods from a high risk country must be fumigated, whether it's offshore or onshore and if your goods have not been off treated offshore the department will not release them for home consumption until they've been treated onshore in a satisfactory man manner. As Sal's mentioned very important to remember that all break bulk flat rack or open top cargo will not be allowed to discharge in Australia if it's not been treated acceptably offshore. Form you can see here uh, little bit small to read, but basically it is a, a form provided to Mondial VGL clients uh, if they are an importer wishing to use Mondial VGL's treatment options. Uh, it's a one-off form that will be provided to, to all, all importers after this webinar, essentially allowing Mondial VGL to perform treatments on your behalf. Now, there are pros and cons of offshore treatment or onshore treatment. In discussing offshore treatment, it can quite often be more expensive uh, depending where in the world you're looking at getting offshore treatment. Uh, some of the countries subject to these measures will not have a huge volume of treatment options uh, or treatment providers. Therefore, costs can be a little bit higher than, than treatment in Australia. There's also... As Sal's mentioned, there are issues with treatment types in certain countries at certain times of the year, uh, not only heat treatment, but I know we've seen in past seasons where treatment providers in Italy specifically have been unable to keep sulfuryl fluoride treatments above the 10 degrees ambient temperature uh, required to allow for them to perform those treatments, uh, meaning that heat is the only option in those areas of the country that are too cold. There are also, as, as I've already mentioned, with some countries having a, a short list of treatment providers, there can be delays at origin where there's too much freight that needs to be fumigated at origin. Uh, and you know, that's something that needs to be weighed up when deciding to treat goods at origin or in Australia. On the positive side of offshore treatment, you often find that it results in a faster turnaround upon your goods arriving at the Australian border. This is because there is no, there should be no requirement for for fumigation and your goods should essentially be released into home consumption for the vast ma majority of shipments with a small proportion going for a verification inspection. And this in turn reduces your costs on import on arrival, uh, such as under bond movements, uh, movements while held by quarantine and any refumigation or or inspection costs associated with local treatment services in Australia. On the onshore side of things, definite positive of having treatments done onshore, uh, that they it minimises any chance of having to re-fumigate due to a suspended service provider, which is something that we've seen in all past seasons so far. And generally in Australia, the treatments that we're seeing are considered to be a higher quality service, which again reduces the risk of the department directing your goods for retreatment uh, if they've been ordered random verification inspection after treatment. And I'll now I'll pass over to Sam to talk about uh, loading containers. Thanks Ross and good afternoon everybody. Uh, here we will show you some of the ways how you should and should not pack a container for treatment. For treatments to be effective, goods must be packed in a way that allows heat or fumigation to travel through and around the container and its contents. Some key points are, Never exceed maximum wall and floor loading requirements. Ensure weight distribution is across the container. Gaps in a container must not cause movement of goods during transport. 
and 65% of cargo accidents are traced back to poor packaging. Containers that have not been packed correctly at origin must be treated here in Australia. Containers must be unpacked and reloaded into one or multiple containers to allow appropriate spacing and placement of treatment equipment. This repacking can only be completed by an accredited supplier and additional costs will occur. The accreditation is called a 4.7. Here you see examples of how to pack correctly for fumigation. In the image on the right, you can see there is enough room to fit equipment on the top for treatment. To be safe, leave a 30 centimeter gap on top of the goods. The image on the left shows there is not sufficient room to complete the treatment as there is other cartons in the way and the gap is not large enough. Another example where there is sufficient room to treat is the right image. The left image is clearly shows there is no room to fumigate and a 4.7 would need to be preceded for treatment. Strapping and wrapping are essential for the safe transport of goods in a container, but goods should not be wrapped or covered in a way that stops the heat or fumigation treatment from penetrating all surfaces of the goods. Packing, packaging may need to be removed, opened or slashed to allow for successful treatment or to allow the treatment to commence. Here are some more examples. The images on the left would need sufficient slashing or wrapping to be opened before any treatment took place. The images on the right clearly show the goods are ready for treatment as they have no plastic wrapping and are held only by strapping. The image on the right is the most effective plastic wrap to use for treatment as it has pre-cut gaps to allow the air to penetrate to the surface of the goods. Again, the image on the left clearly shows these pallets would need to be slashed prior to any treatment commencing. Lessons learnt from last season. On the next slide, we have listed a flow chart of our treatment processes and turnaround times. You will see an estimated timings on a step-by-step -step process for when the vessel arrives into the port. Some of the biggest delays fa faced last year were blacklisted suppliers, post BMSB inspections, congestions and backlogs on site, for example, weather and wharf strikes played a big impact last season, and container packing issues like the previous slide shown. This year, we are prioritizing based on first in, first out. Then secondly, container detention. There will be cases where we need to put certain containers in front of others to avoid large detention fees, but we'll be focusing on maximizing the utilization of the space in the fumigation area. We're also in the process of expanding our fumigation area to allow us to drop more containers and to help avoid additional delays. The best customer visibility is via OneTrack. We will be adding comments and notes in the system this season to show once the container is on the fumigation area and once the container goes under fumigation. Your customer service representatives can show you where to find this. Thanks, Sam. Other lessons that we've learned in past seasons are that, unfortunately, offshore treatment provider suspensions are inevitable. It's something that we've seen in every season uh, of BMSB regulations so far, and it requires uh, importers and freight forwarders alike to be agile in rearranging for the goods to be either redirected on their way to Australia for treatment or retreated once they are in Australia. Unfortunately, it's something that we cannot get around and is governed by the ability to, of the service providers at Origin to perform their treatments correctly. Importers' self-reporting detections is also important. Unfortunately, there are instances every year where some live and dead BMSB get through the system, uh, whether it be caused by a poor fumigation at Origin or poor cleaning after the fumigation. Uh, it's very important for all importers who do find a BMSB-like bug to self-report either to Mondial VGL or to the Department of Agriculture and Water and Environment directly. This is to maintain the safety and integrity of Australia's borders and ensure that this pest doesn't gain a foothold in Australia. Lastly, we've learnt or we've seen every season that the department have not been able to keep up with the demand of freight coming into the country affected by BMSB. It's an unfortunate situation which has meant that there's been lengthy delays which are out of the control of any freight forwarder or importer. That While there's not much we can do about this, as your service provider, it's very important that we note that this is a possibility in future seasons as well. Yeah, thanks, Ross. As mentioned earlier, 
this is a flow chart of our treatment process. Uh, a copy will be available for anyone so they can understand the timeframes and potential delays which we can have once containers arrive onto our sites. Thanks, Sal, Ross and Sam. Let's now delve into our Q&A session. We will go through the, the questions that we, we received during the registration phase first. And whilst we do, if you have any questions um, that you'd like to be answered in real time, just put them in the, in the Q&A box below and we will go through them. So the first question that we've received is from Terry. Um, he is asking, are we going to see massive delays in Australian fumigation as per previous years? I think this question is for you, Sam. Hi Terry, uh, thanks for your question. We have been working on quicker turnaround times this year and uh, key to that is the expansion of our fumigation pad. We're planning to have double the area, so double the area we had last year um, to improve delays on site. Great, thanks Sam. Our next question is from Rod. Um, he's asking, what is the timing for offshore accreditation? Sal, are you able to help with this one? Yeah, um, thanks, thanks Rod, good question. Um, the time it takes to process a new application um, for listing on the BMSB scheme can vary considerably depending on um, a few factors. The number of applications, both new and renewals, the department has at the time, and these tend to peak sort of now in the lead up to the season start on 1 September. The order in which they're received, and you know they obviously process them in order of receipt. The complete completeness of the information received, um, if they need to go back and ask for additional information, obviously that's going to delay the process. Um, the quality of the information provided, you know, is there pictures showing what's needed with clear explanations and um, necessary completion of the uh, online training module. All, all said, the process usually takes around a week or two if um, everything that is needed is provided with the initial application. Great. Thank you, Sal. I do have another question for you. It's from David. Um, we did cover it earlier in the session, um, but he's asking, do open top containers from high risk country, uh, high risk countries require offshore treatment? Yeah. So when it comes to any open cargo, um, break, bulk, flat rack, roll and roll off, open top container, um, any consignments arriving untreatment, untreated, the department, and, and this is a direct quote from them, um, have a zero tolerance in applying their policy. And these containers will be directed for export. There are no exceptions. And furthermore, to, to remember that until 1 December, the 120 hour rule is also strictly in place. So essentially the goods have to be treated within five days of them being loaded. Thanks, Sal. A uh, question from Nicole. Are there again any exemption available for equipment built after a certain date? Do RORO fumigation only apply at departure? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's just, I'm essentially going to contradict the previous answer with, with this answer. And that's to say there is an exemption for those RORO goods, but that's by utilising the exemption of um, new, unused and not field tested that we spoke about earlier. So it's goods manufactured after December 1 that are new, unused, not field tested and are of those limited tariff headings being 82, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88 and 89. Thanks, Sal. I have a question for you, Ross. It's from Lisa. She's asking, how should I plan and choose our container treatment strategy for this season? Should we go off offshore or onshore? It's a great question, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, I would suggest the best option is to discuss this with your Mondial VGL customer service representative who will be able to assist in obtaining rates and availability comments uh, for both the offshore and the onshore treatment options. And then and that once you have that full set of information, it will allow you to make an informed decision as to whether offshore or onshore is the best option for you. I have a question for you, Sam. This is again from Terry. Um, he's asking, do onshore treatment providers use wands? Can we fill the containers to the brim? Uh, hi, Terry, again. Uh, no, you can't. Um, based on the previous slides we went through, um, and I'm sure you can get a copy sent by Christelle. Um, yeah, we need to at least leave about a 30 centimetre gap to be able to put the treatment equipment on top of the goods um, so we can process the... Thanks, Sam. Our next question is from Daniel. Um, he's asking, for what dates do containers leaving Portugal need to be fumigated? We only use onshore Australia fumigation. Is this something you can help us with, Sal? Yeah, so um, if they're shipped between 1 September 2021 and 30 April 2022, uh, they'll need, um, be it offshore or onshore, so, um, anything shipped between those dates will require treatment. Thanks, Sal. Um, a question for you, Sam. George is asking, what is your capacity per day for, for treatment? Uh, do you mean how many containers? Uh, we can fit 3240s on the pad currently, but we're looking at, like I mentioned, we're looking at expanding that 
to double the volume, so 6440s. Uh, Andrew is asking, is Mondial VGL able to do heat treatment this year in Sydney? I think we are. Heat treatment in Sydney? Yes, yes. correct. Uh, another question from Daniel. Is the critical thing the date the container is loaded at the overseas factory or the date the ship departs? I can jump in here, Christelle. Uh, the critical thing uh, for the bulk of the shipments seen through the season will be the shipped on board date listed on the bill of lading. However, in the small number of instances where a container is loaded and sealed prior to September 1st and then the shipped on board date is after September 1st, then there is a, a declaration that can be provided by the, the packer or the shipper, which confirms the the date that the goods were sealed into a container being before September 1st. Thank you, Ross. A uh, great question from Sandy. She's asking, how are LCLs being dealt with um, by Mum Rated Stingbug season? How are we dealing with LCLs? Uh, I'll talk about on in Australia. Uh, we generally do them in some of the empty containers we have in our yard um, or via a tarp. Next question is from Len. Um, to facilitate faster fumigations, why doesn't Mondial VGL get contractors that work on weekends? We have always had contractors that work on weekends. Um, it just depends on the cycle. Uh, you can only do probably three fumigations given the 24-hour turnover during a week. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Question from Rachel. How long prior to a vessel leaving must a container be fumigated? If the boat is delayed, will it then be fumigated again? So the regulations around timeframes for fumigation show that the fumigation must be done within 120 hours or five days of the vessel, of the container being loaded on the vessel. If the shipment is rolled or the vessel is delayed outside of that 120 hour period, then unfortunately, yes, uh, the container will need to be refumigated. Thanks, Ross. Our last question that we've got is from Carol, and she's asking what the costs are for the fumigation services in Australia for this upcoming season. Um, Carol, we do have all that information on hand. This will be distributed to you alongside the uh, agreed to treat um, that uh, the, the form that Ross talked about earlier during the session. So we will be sending all that information to you in terms of the cost and that form by this week. So we'll just wait for a few moments if anyone else has got any questions otherwise we'll wrap up for the afternoon christelle can i just um leave everyone with a final thought that i got from the department go ahead especially Sorry. as we lead into christmas um one of the major concerns they get every year is um around christmas where a supplier will throw in some gifts or promotional material you know there's a classic example of a container of footwear which is not a risk good but um the supplier puts a couple of key rings in as a gift that will that will require that whole container to be treated so um when you're talking to your suppliers tell them if they're going to surprise a gift just tell them to put it in the post we, we've actually had the opposite as well sal whereas it's a um, machine items and obviously it needs fumigation but they put like a, a cake or some sort of food yeah. product in the container as a gift um which still needs to be fumigated anyway so it's going to affect the food quality let's see we have a question from from neil i i'm not really sure if we've got the expertise on board at the moment to actually answer this question but we'll see how we go um neil is saying i understand why you would prioritize fumigation from your clients containers that have short container detention terms with shipping lines however should an importance shouldn't importers be seeking longer container detention terms with the shipping lines if they are importing cargo that will be targeted for bmsb intervention any questions any any comments on that uh, I'd just say, yeah, I, I'd probably agree. If you can get it, if you know you need to get fumigation or some sort of treatment, the longer the detention days is going to be better for you. Was there any other questions that anyone wants to raise before we wrap up for today? Well, if that's the case, I think we will wrap up. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much on behalf of Mondial VGL and all our guest speakers here today, Sam, Ross and Sal. Thank you for coming today and sharing your expertise and time. It really is appreciated. If you have any, any questions at all about the information we shared today, please don't hesitate to get in contact with your Mondial VGL representative. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us.